Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar, uh, which is focused on Urban Living Lab Framework, as Ines mentioned. And in today's presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about living labs in general. And I assume some of you are already familiar with the concept, but I will give you some, I mean, introduction about the living lab in general, the theoretical areas, and then uh, I move to urban living lab as a kind of extended concept of living lab. And then I talk a little bit about urban living lab, what is really not an urban living lab. And after that, I will present the urban living lab framework and the then the key components of an urban living lab framework, I will explain. So let's start by the definition of a living lab. Of course, uh, there has been many, many different perspectives and views on living lab and different uh, researchers and different organizations, they have seen a living lab from different perspectives. And uh, some of them actually have considered a living lab as a tool. Some of them, they have seen it as a method. Some of them, they have considered as an environment or even ecosystem, or in some different perspectives, it can be seen as a big project even. And, but here actually at Botnia Living Lab, we see a living lab more as an approach. And for us, a living lab is an approach to manage open innovation processes uh, in which individual users and also other relevant stakeholders are involved to co-create, uh, implement, test, and evaluate innovations in a real life situation and of course in open and collaborative condition. And as you see, there are some key words here that I have highlighted in this slide. It's important that the end users should be involved. I mean, the focus of Living Lab is on human. It's a kind of a user-centric innovation approach. And uh, different stakeholders should be involved in the process and it's actually based on open innovation. And in the next slide, I will talk a little bit about open innovation. And the context in Living Lab is always a real life situation, everyday use context. And what is also important here uh, that we have mentioned partners, it's important that the partners should be involved in the process uh, from the very beginning. For example, they should not be involved only to test something or to uh, implement something. They should be involved in the whole process of innovation development. And that's the key distinction of Living Lab activities. Uh, so what uh, we should say here is that Living Labs are always flexible with the aim, with, uh, for example, development plan and also uh, with engagement method. And uh, Living Lab actually has uh, been, the concept of Living Lab has been developed based on some key theoretical areas and combining these different theoretical perspectives, you can uh, see the Living Lab concept actually kind of including all of these aspects. It's of course based on open innovation, it's important to include uh, external sources of knowledge and ideas and in uh, open innovation, of course, citizens and end users are always an important and valuable sources of knowledge. They should be included in the process and also other relevant stakeholders that I will get, I will talk a little bit about different stakeholders in Living Lab. And also it's based on socio-technical systems theory. It has been defined based on the interaction between humans and technology. So and you should always include both social aspects of innovation development and also technical aspects. You should also integrate this. That's one of the main aim of Living Lab activities to integrate social and technical parts. Also, uh, it's uh, 
based on design thinking approach, uh, which actually aims to develop solutions for complex problems, of course, the problems that are not well defined. And in different steps, we have actually design thinking. So, I mean, uh, different stakeholders are involved uh, in different phases. For example, they can be involved in ideation, co-creation, prototyping, testing, and evaluating the innovation. Also, participatory design is uh, one area that uh, has influenced a lot on living lab literature and research. Uh, that actually this concept originated from Scandinavian uh, scholars uh, more than 60 years ago. And uh, of course, different co-creation methods and lead users innovation and, for example, crowdsourcing. These are some kind of participatory design approaches. And then it's innovation management. As I mentioned, Living Lab can be seen as a way and approach to manage open innovation processes. And uh, finally, it also relates to a stakeholder's theory. Uh, that uh, different kind of stakeholders, we call it quadruple helix approach. I mean, different kind of uh, stakeholders, they can be citizens or end users, public sectors, private sectors, and uh, also universities and academic institutions. They should be involved. These are actually the key theoretical areas that form actually the basis of living lab research. And after that, we have actually the methodology of innovation development here actually at Botnia Living Lab. We use this method. It's called FORMIT innovation process, uh, which is actually a human-centered approach to develop innovation. And the main aim of this approach, uh, which has four different phases, is to maximize a stakeholder engagement and, of course, including end users. And the process of innovation development uh, is actually consists of four main phases. It's exploration. Uh, that uh, we, we should understand the needs and ideas of end users. It's the first phase. After that, it, the, the innovation will be co-created and designed by including different stakeholders. After that, uh, the innovation will be implemented and tested in real life situation. And finally, it should be evaluated. And based on the feedback, uh, if some improvements are required, it should be taken into account. And what is important in the process of innovation development is that, as you see, it's an iterative process. And uh, for example, if you are in the implementation phase and if you get some feedback, you can directly jump again to the exploration phase. And it's a very flexible approach. This is overall approach of uh, innovation development in Living Lab that we have used in many, many different projects here. And after that, we can move from living lab concept to urban living lab concept and to see what is actually the urban living lab. It's important to think of the concept of living lab and the, the main context that the innovation is being developed. And here, when we say urban living lab, the whole context for innovation and experimentation and evaluation the context is the whole city uh, because of course there are several challenges and uh, you know uh, these days more than I think 50 percent of population are living in urban areas and that creates several challenges for example climate change urban complexity societal challenges uh, citizen quality of life it can be related to fostering the innovation and of course making urban areas more uh, adaptable for citizens. So uh, then we argue that, of course, the cities should be involved in the process of innovation development. And uh, in general, we can uh, actually define urban living lab as a local place that the context, as I said, is the city. And the, the context in urban living lab is more highlighted comparing to the traditional living lab because it's in a larger geographical area and territory. And the main focus of urban living lab is on long-term projects. So it needs long-term commitment between different stakeholders. And of course, it aims to overcome different urban challenges. And here, actually, what is important and what is 
a little bit different with traditional living lab is the way that the process of innovation development should be managed. And so uh, the governance process and management process in urban living lab is more highlighted comparing to the traditional living labs. But uh, in general, of course, all of these keywords that you see here, for example, the citizens and other stakeholders should actively be involved in the process. These are all important points that uh, we need to consider and I will uh, give you some information about these uh, key concepts in the uh, upcoming slides. But uh, it's also of course in an open environment always and in order actually to know what is an urban living lab. It's important to know what is not an urban living lab. So, uh, we can say if the innovation uh, is not co-created with different stakeholders, uh, we don't have an urban living lab. The innovation should be co-created. It shouldn't be very close to one a specific organization. Uh, then it's about the citizens. They, of course, they should be actively involved. They are not in urban living lab. They are not only factors. They are actors. They should be. That is one reason that we usually use the word engagement instead of involvement because citizens, they might have been, they might be involved in the project, but maybe Maybe they don't have an active role. So here we argue that they should, the citizens should actually actively be engaged in the process. And of course, it's important to integrate social and technical aspects of innovation. It's not only a technical project and it's of course not only a social activity. And the context should be always in real life situation. And uh, of course, all relevant stakeholders should be involved in the process. It's a multi-stakeholder engagement approach. And there are also some other uh, points that you should uh, actually consider uh, to see if you, you really have an urban living lab or not. Uh, first, it's about the democracy. Of course, people and citizens, they morally and ethically, they have this right to influence the innovation that they will use. I mean, it's based on ethics and of course, responsible research and innovation is one important aspect of urban living lab activities always. Uh, it should also be innovative uh, and it should be based on uh, new insights. Also, the knowledge should be shared. It should be an environment to co-produce and share knowledge and uh, also, it's important to know that an urban living lab, it's not only a test bed, it's not only a place to test something because uh, end users and citizens, they should be involved in the whole process. And uh, after that, uh, <clears throat> it's also about the infrastructure and services. If, uh, for example, it's very technical infrastructure and service, it's not really an urban living lab. And finally, an urban living lab doesn't necessarily need a building or a physical place. So it's not really a laboratory that you do some kind of activities in a very controlled situation. It's usually uncontrolled condition. Uh, and here actually is uh, different perspectives on urban living labs in general because of course there are different researchers and different living labs. They have tried to understand urban living labs from their perspective and the aim of presenting this table is to show that urban living lab concept is still not a very clear concept and there are many, many different perspectives and definition. For example, uh, different researchers, they have tried to define living lab from their perspective and it's in many different levels. Of course, these studies are 
valuable and very interesting to read. But here, actually, what we argue is that uh, we should start with understanding the key components because here you see different types of, for example, you have activities, you have different actions uh, and a mixture of components, approaches and everything. But uh, we thought <clears throat> it's important to start with understanding the key components of an urban living lab. And it's important to always include all these key components when you want to set up and run your own living lab. And here actually is the main urban living lab framework that we have developed, uh, which is actually based on different cases and projects that we have had here in Botnia Living Lab. And we have compared our uh, previous knowledge with the literature, with the existing literature by conducting an extensive literature review and to see what other uh, researchers they have considered actually as an urban living lab. And in the third phase, we also in UNAL, in the context of UNAL lab project, we have tried to actually complete our understanding about this key component by talking with different cities that uh, are actually involved in UNAL lab project. So uh, actually we have had two workshops and we have had the questionnaire. So we have tried to always refine these key components and uh, we ended up with these uh, seven key components of an urban living lab. And uh, as you see, uh, these, these key components, I will go and present them one by one. But what is very important here is that there are several projects that they can, uh, they actually think of their situation as a living lab, but they sometimes they really don't include one or some of these key components in their activities. Uh, for example, uh, if, uh, all, if not all relevant stakeholders are involved in the projects, or for example, if the innovation development and experimentation is not in the real life situation. So we cannot argue that we really have an urban living lab. So it's important to always include all of these seven key components in an urban living lab. And actually the first key component here is uh, the governance and management, as you saw in the previous uh, picture, which was the, the main framework and model. It can be seen as the basis for the other components in an urban living lab. And as I highlighted in the beginning, uh, this is actually one of the key differences between traditional living labs and urban living labs, because in urban living labs, the role of governance and management is much more highlighted. And it's in general, the way that an urban living lab in the strategic or operational level is managed and organized. And uh, these different activities actually should be supported by different roles. As you see here, we have local government, decision makers, and also politicians. And uh, in relation to this key component, there are uh, several points that uh, you need to consider and it should be taken into account. First, it's important to know what is uh, the vision and the scope of the urban living lab. Uh, after that, it's important also to think of the risks that are actually associated with the process of innovation development. And uh, the next one is important to know and to think of that is uh, about the process of closing the project. And also uh, it's necessary to think of knowledge sharing process if the knowledge sharing process has been successful or not and also dissemination of the result. These are all something that can be related to the management and governance of an urban living lab. Uh, after that, we have the second key component. Actually, in some studies, they have tried to combine governance and management uh, with the 
financing and, and business model, but based on the feedback actually that we got based on our discussion with the cities and also based on our previous cases, we think it should be a separate component. Of course, a sustainable business model that creates and delivers and captures value for all stakeholders in an urban living lab, it's very important. And uh, this sustainable business model for urban living lab actually should include different key elements. For example, it's about key stakeholders, uh, city representatives, decision makers, and uh, for, for example, uh, sponsors. These all should be always, should be considered in a business model. And of course, you need to think of different key activities that you should do, uh, activities that, for example, provides new development processes or coordination of innovation process and also key resources that it can be for example uh, user knowledge business knowledge and also technical knowledge and uh, you can also think of the connection of users and access to the relevant citizens and users and also the channels that you can reach the users and so by thinking of uh, this key component it's important to know how an urban living lab can be set up and then survive. So you should have an urban living lab and think of these key questions in the beginning. If the business model has been clearly defined and uh, if uh, it's really appropriate to support long-term commitment, as I said, long-term projects is one of the key characteristics of urban living labs. Also, it's about maintenance plan, how the maintenance plan actually looks like. And also, you should know the financers, who are the financers and what do they bring. And finally, uh, who actually will pay you and for what if you have a, an, a specified revenue stream. Uh, after that, actually, the third key component in Urban Living Lab is, of course, the context, which is always the city. <clears throat> uh, and the context is actually the physical setting in which the, nat the nature-based solution, I will talk about nature-based solution in the next slide, or we can say the innovation will be implemented. And the city context can be, of course, a street, can be district, neighborhoods, and uh, the whole city. So the points that here you need to take into account, it's about the place and where is the physical setting and then it's about the ownership, who actually owns the setting, who can really stop the process. Then it's about the access, who has access to the physical setting, is it open or restricted and also physical infrastructure, what kind of physical infrastructure is available, for example, electricity, local transportation, etc. And also technical infrastructure, if you have some specific technical infrastructure here, uh, for example, sensors, IoT deployments, 4G, Wi-Fi, fiber or so on. And also the conditions that need to be considered in general, if it pollution or forest or dump or something like that. Uh, other points that you need to think of when you want to uh, actually think of uh, urban context is about the future plan, if there is any future plan for that place, and also the responsibility, who is, who has the responsibility over the context, for example, physical security, who is the responsible for that, and also uh, the, the last one is about different activities that uh, are currently doing in this environment and in this context. Actually, the fourth uh, key component in the framework is nature-based solution. Uh, we always have innovation in living labs and also urban living labs, actually, as a, one important part of living labs. But in the context of urban living lab, the innovation is usually nature-based solution. And a nature-based solution has four main characteristics in general. If it's in the in urban living lab context, it should be innovative and it should address multiple sustainability challenges. Uh, of course, it should be developed and implemented in real life situation and of course it, 
it needs to use nature. And in relation to nature-based solution, there are also some things that you need to think of that. Uh, first is about the aim. You should know what is the aim of the innovation and what value actually this nature-based solution or innovation, what value does it create and for whom uh, does it create value. And then it's about the specific groups of stakeholders or people who can experiment with this nature-based solution and also how this experimentation can be done, what kind of activities should be done. And finally, it's important to know how the results of this experimentation will be used in the city context. So after this uh, component, uh, we have the partners, always including citizens, as the fifth key component of an urban living lab. So it's always important to think of different partners uh, from a quadruple helix approach. As I said in the beginning, it's for main groups of uh, stakeholders. We have users, which in the UNO lab in urban living lab context is uh, citizens. Also, we have public sectors, private sectors and knowledge institutions, and they have different roles, of course. They can be very passive in some uh, steps of innovation development, uh, which of course we don't recommend. We always, that is the aim of living lab to have active and engagement of citizens <clears throat> and different stakeholders. They can be experimenter, they can be innovator, they can be lead users, and they can be also only tester in some specific phase of uh, testing, for example, the solution or innovation. And here, there are some other points that you need to take into account. When you want to engage different stakeholders, and uh, you should actually think of uh, the motivation of the, these stakeholders. How do you want to motivate them to be engaged in this process? And more importantly, how do you want to keep them? I mean, how, for example, how the citizens should be motivated and how should actually they keep motivated in the whole process? They can be, for example, different approaches. Sometimes they participate in the process because of learning. Sometimes you can have, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, financial incentives. And sometimes, for example, you can give them technology in return, for example. And that's also important to think of the place that you should find your stakeholders. For example, maybe they are students, maybe you will, <clears throat> sorry, find them in public channels or NGOs or something like that. These are something that you always need to think of that and what kind of activities, for example, these different stakeholders should do in the process of uh, innovation development. And uh, actually we have two last components. Uh, one is approach and methodology. and. It's very important that you always think of overall approach of innovation development in an urban living lab. And urban living lab approach always includes supportive tools, data collection and data analysis methods and engagement methods. And for engagement methods, as I said in the beginning, it can be many different approaches. For example, you can have different brainstorming sessions with the citizens, you can have workshops, you can have some serious games, or there are many different approaches of actually engaging citizens. And that's more or less the case with other stakeholders sometimes. You, you should know how do you want to engage them and what kind of data are you going to collect. And in relation to the approach and methodology, it's important to always take into account the main key principles of an urban living lab. And here you can see five key principles uh, that it should be always open and inclusive. It should be explorative. It should be responsible and sustainable. And it should be, I mean, the experimentation and development should be done in real life situation and it should 
always create value and you can think of these five key principles in all steps of innovation development for example in the beginning i i explained that uh, based on format methodology we have four main phases we have exploration we have design we have then implementation and finally evaluation so for example in exploration phase you can think of uh, openness and inclusiveness is it based on open calls is it disseminated in public channels or or so on or for example in the last phase in test you can think of real life condition you can think if the test is really in real life situation or for example considering responsible research and innovation you can think if you have really considered ethical issues to engage citizens in the process so uh, it's a mixture of key principles and different steps of innovation development and uh, finally we have uh, the last key component of an urban living lab which is ICT infrastructure and it's uh, actually the existing and desirable ICT tools and infrastructure that support urban living lab activities and we have ended up with four main categories it can be hardware software data and network and uh, what is actually important to know is that to identify actually these uh, key infrastructures in your city so then it will be much easier for you to use them in the process you should for example know who is responsible for each of these key components each of these components in the city uh, in in relation to the infrastructure if there are for example some servers or if there are some specific data you should for example think of data and you should make a clear distinction between for example open data and closed data what kind of data is possible to be shared and what kind of data is not and these are some things that and in general uh, in relation to ICT infrastructure you should think that what is specifically this ICT tool and who uses it and uh, where is it located and uh, of course if there are any kind of future plan if these ICT tools will be used in the other project on or in the other ways you should try to understand these uh, relations between different uh, actually key in ICT infrastructures that you have so uh, it will be much easier for you to manage the process of uh, using this infrastructure in innovation development process